Welcome to the My Blockchain Island Podcast. For all the latest info on DLT, blockchain, startups, Malta and beyond. Here's your hostess, Carla Marie. Hi everyone, today's guest is Jonathan Gallia from Blockchain Advisory Limited, or better known as BCA. Today, Jonathan and I are going to discuss the three bills published by the Maltese government. Before we get started, here's a quick word about our sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by Talent XD. Talent XD is a boutique recruitment and talent advisory house specialized in iGaming, esports, financial services, and blockchain. For more information, check out talentxd.com. That's talentxd.com. Jonathan, nice to see you. Hi, thanks a lot, Carla, for the invite. Um, uh, hello as well to all our, our lovely listeners. Um, it's a true pleasure to be here on this episode today. Cool. The government came out with a proposal in November 2017. However, you were involved in the space much earlier than that. Can you give us a little bit of a historical account of what brought forward the proposal and what were some of the discussion points around that? Sure, yeah, I'll try and keep it as brief as possible. Basically, I've been involved in the space since 2013 and I got involved in it out of pure curiosity, I would say. So I started off um, um, mining cryptocurrencies, got more involved in the tech aspect, and I completed my law degree and uh, from then on I started focusing on blockchain cryptocurrencies. Essentially, I would say that like most other people, um, uh, the government and also the, the local authorities could see that this could become um, a new industry by itself. So uh, first, I would say in, uh, sometime in 2015, mm-hmm. 2016, um, uh, the government started, of course, focusing its attention on this particular niche area. Yep. Um, and back then, I would say the space was uh, even more unknown than it is today. Mm. And uh, first and foremost, what the government did is basically it uh, devised a form of strategy to, again, tackle this new industry. So uh, initially, this industry was sort of being compared to the gaming industry. Okay. Mm. And that, can I just stop you on that point? Because... I think a lot of our listeners might n- might know Malta as being like the blockchain island, but I think that we kind of held the flag as being the iGaming, iGaming island a little bit before that. And maybe we can just, just maybe I'll just include this. It's just like Malta has a history in, in being the iGaming place, especially in Europe. So the local ecosystem has kind of a basis on regulation and jurisdiction prior to the whole blockchain piece, right? Um, so I'll let you continue. Yeah, but, but we can draw a parallel on that and basically say that Malta was the first one to regulate the iGaming space in Europe. Mm-hmm. And once again, Malta is the first one to regulate the blockchain cryptocurrency space in a comprehensive manner in Europe as well. Right. So that's the parallel which should be drawn. But the parallel, I think, should stop there. For the mere reason that whereas the gaming industry is quite a large industry of its own, um, the blockchain cryptocurrency space, I would say, will dwarf the gaming industry in the next five years. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just to be, just to be like, just set, stating the obvious, I guess, it's just like gaming is just one vertical, whereas blockchain encapsulates every single industry out there. Um, so I think that it's much broader. Yeah, exactly. I mean, blockchain will underpin most of the major industries in the years to come. Yes. So that's why I would say, yes, I agree with you. It's yeah. much bigger. Okay, sense. so we're, we're talking back to 2016-ish, the government are starting to think, yeah, this is uh, this blockchain stuff, pretty cool. Um, how can we encapsulate this and, and become, you know, a regulator, a key regulator in, in the European or even in the global landscape for this for this sector? So can you give us some insights on how the preparation, the thoughts, the feelings towards the, the proposals came, came about? So essentially, again, the government was reaching out its feelers, seeing what other jurisdictions were saying about it all. Um, uh, and essentially, of course, keeping an eye on the monitoring and developments in the space, while at the same time consulting, um, let's say, industry thought leaders, both here in Malta and especially from abroad. So that's what gave birth to the uh, national blockchain strategy. 
initially, um, I would, the governor was trying to bring on board the, um, the big four uh, firms and other major firms here in Malta to give their insights on the matter. It collected feedback from uh, such firms, but then what happened was that um, I would say it wasn't exactly a short circuit of the whole system, but we could see that other countries were making some very fast progress in the space. Mm -hmm. So we naturally had to identify the most important part of the strategy, the strategy which was mm -hmm. the regulatory aspect. Correct. So Malta then shifted its, its attention to what is perhaps the weak spot of all the other jurisdictions in space, yeah. which is because, Exactly. I mean, like, if we look at how, <laughs> um, if we look at how, what happened in the US, <laughs> uh, I, I'm laughing a little bit because I'm remembering an article I read. Um, but a lot of, like, a lot of my international friends actually said, like, will Malta end up coming out of the box with something similar to, to what the US tried? And I was like, no, no, no. I, I can assure you it's a much more diligent process than that. Um, so, okay, so let's, let's, I mean, I, I remember being part of some, some public Q and A forums as well around like, how do you intercept blockchain in investments and, and what's your understanding and how high is the demand and. But yeah. it's fine that you should mention the US because when I wrote my uh, thesis in 2015, uh, one of my conclusions in the regulatory aspect was that the US was leaving the space mm. back then. But it's not quite that way now at all. No, 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 definitely not. Definitely not. Um, I don't know what exactly happened. Some blamed SEC mm. for it all. But essentially, whereas the US was leading uh, the charge on both the regulatory and on the technical front, all of a sudden, um, due to certain unfavorable decisions as perceived by the community, by the SEC, mm. I would say that most of the business in the US is now looking towards more favorable jurisdictions such as Malta. Yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of them are moving out, um, which is a bit of a shame because it would be, be. I mean, lots of people that that I speak to are more favor favored towards or leaning towards um, multiple jurisdiction position, and I think that's sensible. Um, but also, let's um, let's also say that you know it, it will take one to to lead, and then others will learn from that as well. So I think that what we might see today is a collective learning already of some of the, the previous attempts to regulation and what could be also expanded on that. Exactly. Um, so let's fast forward in, into 2018. Um, uh, the proposal came out end of 2017. It promised bills, three bills. Um, and uh, I'd like to help our listeners understand a little bit because not everybody loves to read long legal documents. I know that this is your passion. and, and I find it boring as well. So. Do you? Okay. <laughs> I must admit. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Then, then I, I didn't know that about you because yeah. one, one of my other friends actually co collects um, legal documents and definitions and stores them. And, and he was like, do you want me to share the link with you? I was just like, uh... If I say yes, will it be that I'm too much of a I mean, don't get me wrong, I love interpreting the law, I love um, basically applying it to real world use and so on. But when it comes to actually reading, you know, I don't know, 80, 100 pages of long <laughs> text written in legalese and so on. No, no, no. Wait, you've read the bills, right? I've read the bills, of course. <laughs> no, 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 I've read the bills. But the part I enjoyed uh, reading the most, uh, actually, the definitions and how those are applied throughout yeah. the, re the whole text of yeah. the law, and how, of course, they can be applied to, yeah. again, real world. Yeah. Um, I've had some arguments well. about the definitions. I'll, I'll say I'll say that I always have arguments about the definitions. You always I, have I, I think, <laughs> Actually, I think definitions are the most important. You're a lawyer. Definition. You're supposed to have arguments. Oh, of course. Of course. <laughs> But it's funny because most of the time definitions are almost ignored at times. And I think they are the most important it's, part. They are the most important part in point of any piece of legislation. I think it's going to be uh, awesome because now you've just given me an idea to have like a, a panel about like definitions on the podcast. That would be fantastic. I think that would be so much fun um, for those people who like to read documents and uh, listen to definitions. Okay, slight tangent, a little bit off track. Let's give people what they're listening for. So um, let's talk about the Malta Digital Innovation Authority Act, which is one of the, I believe it's the first act, right? In, uh, in order, yeah. Yeah, uh, in on, the on, order. On the justice, uh, exactly. Website. So um, what can you tell us about the MDIA? The MDIA, um, uh, interestingly enough, 
is the first authority of its kind in the world. Why? Simply because it's the first regulatory authority which will be issuing certification in relation to blockchain-based applications or platforms, or rather DLT-based applications and platforms. Tech. Tech, Ex exactly. And such uh, applications and platforms are defined as technology arrangements in the Act itself as well. So we'll be using that term in all words. Essentially, the modern uh, DMDIA, in short, uh, will be issuing certification for technology arrangements which are, let's say, um, built uh, in or developed here in Malta or launched from here in Malta. The way it will work is that essentially the Malta Digital Innovation Authority will work through a system um, of third-party system auditors. Okay. So rather than the MDIA being the one which will be basically auditing and checking such technology arrangements, the MDIA would rely on the findings of the system auditors and then the MDIA will basically uh, stamp such technology arrangements uh, with its approval or otherwise if, if of course the system auditors find that there's something wrong with technology okay. arrangements. So they're relying on experts to to enable the certification? Exactly. The, the only part which is centralized is uh, essentially the rubber stamping process. Okay. But the auditing process itself will be, let's say, decentralized and of course, the system auditors need to be licensed by the MDIA. Great. Okay, so I think that the first act pretty much just sums up the processes of the MDIA, mm -hmm. right? The processes and rather the constitution of the MDIA. Okay. Um, I would say that the more interesting act in, um, in this particular area is the Innovation, Innovation Technology Arrangements and Services Act. Okay. Before we jump onto that, though, can I just like ask one question? So I, I heard that... If you have a, let's say, financial services company that the actual MFSA, the Malta Financial Services Authority, just for those foreign listeners who don't know these acronyms, um, is the actual regulating party. Or just for case and example, if you have a gaming company um, or a gambling company or an esports company, for example, you would go to the MGA, the Malta Gambling Authority, and then they would collaborate with the MDIA for the certification. Am I correct in what um, I understood here? Yes, and that's a very valid point. So the point of departure remains the underlying industry. Okay. If, let's say, there's a project which, I don't know, that they're building a decentralized casino, for example. Okay. The first port of call will remain the Malta Gaming Authority. So, so, so let's say Satoshi Dice wanted to become regulated in, uh, in Malta. They would yes. have to go to the MGA, Correct. go through the apl application process there, and then there would be a synergy between the MGA and the MDIA for the blockchain part. Correct. Okay. And the MDIA will be supporting all existing regulatory authorities. Okay. So let's say there's a, there's a company which is issuing tokens in relation to its um, mobile telephone service, for example. The MCA will be the responsible authority, but then again, the MDA will be brought in due to technical expertise and uh, for its auditing prowess right. and so on. And the MCA, just for clarification, is the Malta Communications Authority. Yes. We like our M's and A's in, in Malta. Um, okay, and let's jump on to your favorite act. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> well, I'm mean, smiling. I, 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 I tend to be objective, so I don't have any particular um, favorite act, but I must say that I think this is the one act which does encapsulate the, the technical side of the, of the legislation, and that is the Innovative Technology Arrangements and Services Act, or ITAS in short. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the ITAS lays out the requirements for the auditing process itself. Okay. So it defines the system auditors, it states the requirements the system auditors need to have. Um, Can you give us an example of a requirement? So as, as a, essentially, um, a systems auditor needs to be located in the EU and the EEA, um, and of course they need to be licensed by the MLA, so they, so they need to have a track record in the business or otherwise show their expertise in the, in the industry in order to be approved as systems auditors by the MDIA. Okay. Now, um, uh, it also lays out requirements for administrators of the technology arrangements. So any technology arrangements which, um, uh, let's say, are looking to be certified by the MDIA need to appoint a responsible person for their own platform or application. Okay. Now, of Is course, this the BF? Agent no, 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 it's not the VFA agent. It's simply a, um, a technical administrator. Oh, so we're still platform. on tech. Okay. We're still on tech. Great, great, great. Now, 
the first question which crops to mind, and of course, I assume our listeners will also be asking this question is, how do we appoint a, a person who's responsible for a decentralized arrangement? And I'll tell you, yes, you're right. However, keep in mind that most of the platforms which will be seeking um, approval by the MDIA will be small platforms normally launching in an ICO, and they need to have some form of, let's say, stamp of approval by uh, an authority, but they're still a regulatory authority. Okay. So again, we're looking at, towards attracting startups, we're looking towards attracting um, uh, businesses which are looking to develop uh, their own um, uh, technology arrangement, and they want to have it certified by a competent body. So the technology arrangements needs to appoint um, a, an administrator. The administrator will be answerable to the MDIA, and the technology arrangement itself needs to be audited by an approved systems auditor. Okay. Now, on that point as well, um, another question which might arise is essentially, what is the standard that will be used by the systems auditors? Okay. And truth be told, right now there is no set standard in place. Okay. We're still in a very new industry. Um, uh, we don't have anything um, uh, yet in place in terms of an international standard. However, that just makes, I, I would say, the environment more exciting for systems auditors. Because those systems auditors who, again, um, are really good at their job, they manage to build a reputation here in Malta. And in turn, build, build an international reputation, they might have their standard being recognized as the official standard for the industry internationally. Mm, cool. Um, so, when we when we talk about like the type of companies that might be interested in, in moving this way in association to these um, to these acts, um, w as a company, I would want to look at this act. Probably this would be the one act that I would want to kind of read. If you're a company which is coming here to Malta to launch, typically an ICO, and uh, the, the company wishes to have its uh, platform recognized by, by a state authority, then I would say yes. The interesting thing about this is that anyone wishing to launch uh, from Malta, whether it be an application platform, whatever it may be, um, they can voluntarily choose to have their technology arrangement certified by the MDIA. So you don't need to come over here and be forced to basically apply with the MDIA. The only time where you might be requested by an authority to have your application or platform certified by the, by the MDIA is if you're launching an ICO and the tokens issued in the ICO are classified as a virtual financial asset. Okay, and I guess that brings us on to the third act. Exactly. Do you like this act? I like all that. I'm very impartial. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I basically advise on all three acts. Um, uh, the Virtual Financial Assets Act, I would say, is the act which tackles the financial um, segment of this whole space. Mm. And I think it's it's not an easy act. I I have to say, there's lots of different interpretations within within definitions. I would say within the VFA Act, and and I've heard different opinions about this, um, but. Can you maybe tell us a little bit like just the actual nuts and bolts of the details of the act and, and what, what, you know, what the objectives are? Sure thing, yeah. As you said, it was not an easy balancing act to carry out. Um, to this very day, I would say that, uh, again, a lot of uh, clauses in the act are subject to interpretation. Because, of course, all these acts are principles-based. Mm. want to just create a framework and not actually uh, mm. stifle everything with precise... On, on that note, I think it's worth saying that, that one thing um, that has been made very clear um, by the government bodies is that a lot of what's there today might change. Um, and, and I kind of look at that as... I look at that positively, like lots of people, like lots of people, some people are a little bit skeptic in the sense that they, they seem to come about and, and, you know, want to criticize before understanding how maybe difficult it is to put this type of thing in play. Um, so, so I think that a lot of what we see today is, is it like you said, like perfectly, it's subject to interpretation, but it's more about being there and then we'll grow and learn from it. Correct. Um, yes. And in fact, the act have to be to a certain extent technology neutral, but at the same time, this How? is a whole new other How? technology. <laughs> we exactly. don't know what technology is going to come out next week, let Correct. alone, you know, and, and we're still trying to understand very much, uh, you know, the frameworks that are in place today. So I think, I think, yeah, exactly. I am full agreement with you on that. Okay. So let's jump into it. The Virtual Financials Asset Act. What, what's there to know there? What do we need to know? 
So essentially, the first financial assets act or the VFAA, I uh, hope I remember to say the second H at every time, <laughs> um, essentially regulates the primary and secondary markets of cryptocurrencies. Okay. So starting with the primary markets, uh, we're talking about the issuers of cryptocurrencies. So those looking to uh, conduct an ICO um, uh, will most likely need to register their white paper with the Water Financial Service Authority, I'm going to say in short, um, if they wish to conduct the ICO in or from Malta. Okay, because it's capital, right? And they're the financial financial authority, so they need to keep track on that. Correct. I mean, at the end of the day, as you said, they're raising capital, they're raising funds, there are investors involved, and ultimately the regulator is there to protect the investors. Exactly. So, of course, we're creating a safe haven, both for the investors and also, of course, for those wishing to issue their ICO, their tokens, in a regulated environment. I think, I think in a way, like, I look positively towards companies who do come forth and try to be regulated, um, because it gives me a little bit more more confidence in in the you know in, in the ICOs that are being launched. So that's that's a nice. It's just a feel good feeling, I guess. Yeah. I mean, uh, as as an aside, we've had uh, clients come up to us and say, "Listen, we were choosing Malta because we want to be regulated. We know it's the first country regulating this space in a thorough manner, so we want to stay here." Mm-hmm. Uh, conversely, we've also had uh, people approaching us saying, "Listen." Um, we're in the crypto space, but we don't really care about money laundering rules and so on. Um, we're just going to Malta because that's uh, where you know most of the activities are taking place. And yeah. Whatever. Listen, you have the wrong impression about Malta. If you want to work here in Malta, you have to be fully regulated. So unless you're willing to abide by the rules, um, we're very sorry. About I mean, I I think I think like you said earlier, you said you said earlier that there's you know there's like one parallel to be made to gambling or the eye gaming sector, as we like to softly call it. Um, but I do feel that, that, you know, that sector has prepared us as a nation and as like, uh, as regulators towards, to gear towards the, the, the um, any, money, any money laundering position. Um, you would not see one gaming company on this island getting away with like like AML. No, and then similarly to the gaming industry in its infancy, there were lots of cowboys in the industry. Oh yeah. Um, same goes for crypto as well. Yeah. I yeah. mean, uh, it's basically the wild wild west all over again, and we're trying to introduce an element of sanity and regulation in it all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, because we keep on diverging. So, um, going on about the Virtual Financial Assets Act, we mentioned, of course, the issuers, yep. which will not need a license, but if they're going to issue a Virtual Financial Asset, we'll go to that shortly, essentially they need to have their white paper in line with the Act itself and also register their white paper with the Mota Financial Services Authority. Then we have the other side of the coin, which is basically um, the so-called VFA services. And these are services which require a license under the Act, and they include exchange services, um, custodian services, brokerage, dealing on account of others, and so on and so forth. Um, all these activities will require a license by the MFSA and they are fully regulated under the Act as well. So as you can see, um, uh, essentially the VFA Act regulates both the issues of cryptocurrencies and also what happens in those cryptocurrencies once they are out on the markets um, and of course uh, people start of course conducting certain services in relation to such cryptocurrencies. What kind of tokenomics does the do the acts cover? So essentially the act doesn't strictly regulate tokenomics. What the act does is however list certain requirements including tokenomics which need to be included in the white paper. Okay. So there's a whole list of criteria that need to be included in the white paper if it's to pass the scrutiny of the MFSA. And they have, they have quite a meter list of, uh, of criteria up to the point where they had to start all of, uh, the alphabet all over again when it's in the criteria. <laughs> so I think in total there's around 40 elements which need to be included in the white paper. I mean, most of today's professional white papers do include such elements. Yeah. Ultimately, it's just... Uh, I mean, if you look at of... white papers like a year ago to now, or just six months ago to now, they're yeah. just like light, night and day. Like, yeah, and, and I mean, there are some white papers which I advised around uh, a year or so ago. Yeah. And if I look at them nowadays, I would say, listen, there needs to be a lot more um, oh, yeah, in them yeah. in order to be approved by the VFA, uh, exactly. under the VFA Act. I mean, that's good in a way. Do, do, do the MFSA and the MDIA kind of impose on how your white paper should look or are they just giving guidelines? 
Actually, they're not just guidelines, but the MFSA actually listed the requirements, which need to be listed in the white paper. Um, uh, ultimately, of course, if there are certain elements which can't be included in the white paper, so for example, if the token is not issued through a smart contract, then you can't include that, that in the white paper. Um, uh, the, keep in mind that any ICOs being issued from Malta need to have their platform, or at least their technical papers, approved by, um, by the MDIA. So uh, that's where the MFSA and the MDA will be working. That's the collaboration we exactly, were talking about Exactly. Before. And of course, if the MDA feels a certain elements that need to be put in the white paper, then of course it will give such, such uh, suggestions as well. Cool. Um, how, how about, like, there's lots of discussions in the US about securities, utilities. Um, what's the position in Malta when it comes to, you know, so in, in the US, um, they went, I would say, for a, for a binary approach. Either it's a security token or it's not. Mm -hmm. Here in Malta, we went, I would say, a step further. And we introduced um, a three-tiered classification. We have financial instruments, virtual tokens, and virtual financial assets. Okay, and this is in the last act, right? The, it's all in the last act. It's all in the last so act. So if anybody wants to like read about, you know... Security tokens, utilities, and everything other and above, that's the act they need to read. Correct. Or they need to continue listening because you're going to tell us all about it. Oh, I'm going to explain a bit further about it. So <laughs> <laughs> those interested. Leave it to you, Jonathan. <laughs> Leave it to you. I'll keep you entertained, so don't worry about that. Um, uh, starting with financial instruments. So, uh, financial instruments include securities, they also include uh, debt instruments, um, emission credits, um, uh, and other. Um, instruments which are regulated under the MIFID II directive, okay. the Markets and Financial Instruments Directive. And this II. is European thing. This is European European. Because uh, lots law. of lots of people from the states like MIFID II, I'm like yeah, MIFID so, II. So this is an EU wide directive. Uh, it's been implemented in all EU member states. It's so, very important. Yes, it's very important, and basically it's been transposed into Maltese law under the Investment Services Act. Perfect. We're talking about the equivalent of security tokens. So if anyone wishes to, let's say, I don't know, issue tokenized equity, for example, then they would be regarded as a financial instrument and regulated under European Union laws. Okay. So that's the first category, and that category has been regulated for quite a while. Yeah. Right? Moving on to the second category, virtual tokens. I'd like to call them utility tokens. However, utility tokens are normally traded on exchanges. The fact that a utility token is traded on, on an exchange may lead to the token not being classified as a virtual token. But anyway, let's define what a virtual token is. So essentially a virtual token is a token whose only use or value or application is in relation to the acquisition of goods or services on the platform on top of which it is issued. So uh, using the um, the decentralized casino example once again. Mm. So it's within its own ecosystem. Yeah, exactly. exactly. If, you're, if you're having your own casino yeah. and you issue your own uh, token and you tell your users, listen, your players, if you want to use uh, play in my casino, you have to buy my token and you can only use um, uh, my token in my casino. Okay. That is a good example of a virtual token. Yeah. Um, then we have the third umbrella category of virtual financial assets. And uh, essentially, any token which is not a financial instrument, but nor is it a clear-cut virtual token, that would be classified as a virtual financial asset. And essentially, the Act regulates virtual financial assets. And in fact, any exchanges licensed under the VFA Act will be licensed to list virtual financial assets as well as virtual tokens, because at the end of the day, virtual tokens will not fall within the remit of any applicable regulation. Okay. There's a few other things that, that have been like articulated, um, such as the VFA agents. Correct. And I assume that this is very much in, in association to what we've just been talking about, as well as the instruments test, right? Precisely. Okay. So what I've just explained, um, basically the classification of the different tokens, that is known as a financial instruments test. It's a test which has been prepared by MFSA. Um, uh, essentially, it gives a very clear rendition of how tokens to be classified 
due to its underlying criteria. Right. So I'll include that in the in the notes, uh, the show notes, if anybody's interested in 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 trying, because anybody can 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 yeah. do that. So, right. Yeah. So yeah, the fire yeah. test has been published by FSA. It's still in its beta form, but essentially it's an Excel sheet which will take you through all the steps that are required to classify the token. So yeah. So if you're if you're savvy on on your your token position, financial positions, and so on, you can just go in there and and give it a try, and and then you can. Give Jonathan a call and 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 debate and discuss, because um, that's what I do. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and I love doing that. So, and one feel free to pick my brains on this. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um. So, do you wanna do you wanna explain the VFA agent position then? Yeah, I will. Um. Uh, essentially, if one is to conduct an activity which is, uh, let's say, caught under the VFA Act and they need to approach the MFSA with regards to their business activity, they cannot do so directly. Mm -hmm. But they would need to do so through a licensed VFA agent. A VFA agent can be any lawyer, law firm, accountant, auditor, and so on and so forth, um, who has, of course, knowledge of the industry and who is licensed as a VFA agent by the MFSA. And this is still still kind of rolling out, right? Because last time we were at the the induction meeting together they were going to launch their course i think in september so yeah. there are no actual physical vfa agents as we record this not today. yet not yet no. um, in fact the mfsa has indicated that the regulations uh, and the guidelines will become effective sometime in the first week of october mm -hmm. so up until then of course this, uh, the applications uh, will not be available until then there will be no official VFA agent up to them. Okay, that's um, good to clarify. I mean, uh, at time of recording right now, I, there's no such thing as a VFA agent. However, it's been proposed that this will be how it will work. Correct. And uh, beyond that, right now, there is no exchange here in Malta which is licensed by the MFSA. Reason being that, of course, if one wants to apply for a license under the VFA Act, first of all, it needs to be effective through the guidelines and the regulations. Secondly, one will need to apply through a licensed VFA agent. Good. So this is this is actually quite a quite a good point because we've seen like so many companies come to Malta and and make claims and media and like we've moved to Malta because we're going to be regulated. But I think it's very important to kind of give a status on the bills. Like these are bills, right? They're not in the law yet. No. So they were bills up until the third and final reading by Parliament. Okay. Upon the third and final reading by Parliament, they were approved um, unanimously, I must say, by the Maltese Parliament. Um, and then the legal notice, um, basically stating that they um, are now to become acts, was issued, I believe, around a couple of weeks ago. Okay. But, um, but all of them? All of them. All of them. All of them are now no longer bills to be discussed by Parliament, but okay. that they are now acts. However, they are not yet effective. They okay, that's effective. the point I was trying to get to. Okay, thanks for correcting me. So they're not effective yet because they no. still need to be written in the government gazette, I, I believe, and that's what officiates them. That's no, apart from that, it's more the fact that the responsible authorities, so the, the MFSA, the MDIA, and so on, they need to issue the guidelines in order to, uh, again, um, uh, bring into effect such uh, such acts. And essentially, it uh, officially will be the minister responsible for digital innovation who will then proclaim such acts as effective. Great. So any company that's out there up to this point saying that they are regulated in Malta is telling naughty, naughty lies. Exactly. There is, as of yet, there is no single company uh, or entity which is yet licensed here. Okay. So... That leaves a, that le leads to another question. So so what are you, what are you doing like on a day to day basis with your clients? So essentially, um, so our client base consists of ICOs, uh, security token offerings, uh, crypto funds, crypto exchanges. Um, crypto funds, funnily enough, have been regulated uh, by the MFSA since the start of this year, since okay, January of this year. Great. But that's the only um, area which is regulated. Because it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's, it's not It's not quite as complicated. You as can uh, basically um, so open up a professional investor fund and one of the assets in which the uh, PIF can invest in is cryptocurrencies. So essentially, that's just a normal PIF, which is authorized to invest in cryptocurrencies. And you said PIF. It's a professional investor fund. Thank you. Yes. Good. Because we're, we're so used to abbreviations and, and then we say them so much and then people like look at me kind of like, what was that? So I try and clarify as much as possible. Um, okay. So 
Right now, are you working a lot with, I'd say, companies that are anticipating the law to go live then? Correct. And what's the process that people are, like, what, what processes are you helping them with? Like? Essentially, um, those wishing to, of course, conduct a license activity here in Malta are well advised to set up a company in Malta. And uh, Are well advised. Do they have to? Truth be told, this is one of the points which is still under discussion in the guidelines on the okay. Financial Assets Act. Okay, but I mean, there, there's a, there's another podcast episode that I, I, I recorded with uh, Anthony David Gutt from Malta Enterprise, and he ran through a heap of benefits that startups in the blockchain space can can Oof, get yes. value yes, from yes, by yes. being Malta based. So I think like let's just leave that to deb- be defined. We don't need to debate that, but. Having a Maltese company surely has its benefits from other perspectives. So that might, that's kind of a requirement maybe to be defined. Okay, what and else? I'm being objective here, but Malta is a fantastic jurisdiction which set up uh, yeah. business. I mean, like if I was a foreigner, I'd certainly set up a company here in Malta. So, uh, of course, if they decide to set up the company in Malta, um, uh, then the next uh, step is to establish some form of presence here in Malta. Mm-hmm. The presence can be established through various ways and means, Explain um, that. such as appointing a local resident director, um, um, obtaining a local bank account, um, opening up a satellite office here in Malta. Okay. In fact, a lot of people I know are actually in the process of doing that. Yes. Like a lot of my friends from the US actually have like already started the process of setting up their companies, getting their satellite offices here, appointing different different types of people that they need. They're kind of starting to use Malta as their European base, which is quite quite... It's quite good. It's quite creative. I mean, Malta's pretty centralized in terms of getting into Europe, and it's a really nice place to be in general. So, yeah, I mean, I like it. it. I live here. I love it. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and I live here as well. So <laughs> that's the reason why. Apart from the fact that I was born and bred over here, <laughs> you have no, you have no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> so the next step, then, of course, is to identify the business activity which the company wishes to conduct. Now, there's a general misconception that one cannot conduct, let's say, an ICO at this moment in time. Simply because it is not yet regulated. Okay. That's a misconception. Okay, so you, so you can crack on with your ICO. Yeah, definitely. definitely. I mean, We're not going to stop you from doing your No, stuff. we've helped some companies conduct their ICO. Um, they've completed their ICO okay. and they've done so in a, in a yet unregulated environment. Okay. So essentially, you can conduct your business activity right here and now because it is not yet regulated. What happens to companies that have done their ICO and, and once the regulation comes in? Essentially, the primary offering thereof would remain unregulated. Okay. But then the next step will be if their token is classified as a British financial asset and they want their token listed on a VFA exchange here in Malta, then they need to ensure that the white paper conforms with all the requirements under the VFA Act. So would they have to then go through regulation process themselves? Well, yeah, I mean, they need to appoint a VFA agent who will tell them how to structure the white paper in such a manner as to make so it compliant. Potential updates to the, to the white paper and, yeah. then, and then application through the normal processes. Correct. So right now what lawyers and uh, other service providers are doing, even though it's yet an unregulated environment, um, anyone wishing to conduct, let's say, an ICO from Malta mm-hmm. would be well advised to ensure that the white paper conforms to the requirements under the Act itself, cool. even though it is not yet effective. Cool. I mean, this is this is a good point because I think a lot of people are are thinking like, okay, I, you know, Malta only if I'm pre ICO, but essentially it's it's broader than that if you even if you're post ICO you could still be be knocking on the door right no the thing is uh, to keep in mind is that when it comes to starting an ICO the regulator in the consultation document for the guidance has made it very clear there's a difference between the private offering and the public offering okay by private offering we mean directly approaching investors um uh, the investment route is not public at all it's not advertised no. And you simply call that initial capital okay. from persons you know and trust. Yeah. That is a private round. Yeah. Public round, even if it's called a pre-ICO or whatever under whatever under the nomination whatever you want to call under, it, yeah. if it's a public offering, even in a let's say with certain restrictions, it is still the public stage. If you start public stage before the regulations are in place, then you will have a grace period of three months within which to comply with the regulations okay, cool. once they become effective. Okay, cool. That's very if interesting. You, yeah, if, if you conclude your ICO before the regulations are in place, then essentially you would fall outside the remit of the applicable regulation. Okay. All right. Cool. Cool, cool. Very interesting. Um, so, no VFA agents, ICOs in their stages, 
different stages and, and how to approach. We've covered that. Is there anything else that we should be thinking about from, from a regulation position? I mean, just a general piece of advice, and I've seen it um, being, it's, it's a mistake which is done by most people who have been in the space for a long time, and they believe that if they're doing anything in relation to cryptocurrencies, then it's not regulated. I mean, even if you're conducting an ICO in an unregulated jurisdiction, it doesn't mean that you are, strictly speaking, unregulated. There are still certain laws, such as data protection, AML, um, and other applicable uh, regulations that will still apply for your offering or your business activity, whatever it may be. So what I do encourage um, our listeners is that essentially, if you're doing anything in relation to the crypto space, it does not mean that you are automatically excused from any applicable laws whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You still need to conform to certain rules and regulations in whatever jurisdiction you might be in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a good piece of advice, and I, I agree. I agree fully, actually. Cool. Um, so, uh, I think we've covered really some really in insightful points. Jonathan, how can people reach you if, if they want to get in touch? So, um, basically, I have my LinkedIn profile, my Facebook profile, although I normally tend to use LinkedIn for business. Um, spam, uh, spam, spam, <laughs> spam. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I have my own uh, email address as well. Of course, I do. Um, it's uh, Jonathan dot galia g a l e a at b c a dot com dot m t wonderful i'll plug that into the show notes so that people can reach you directly through them um awesome are you traveling or attending or speaking at any conferences in the next couple of months that you'd like to let us know about yeah so uh, over the past uh seven months eight months actually from the end of this year i attended over 20 conferences so in august i took a bit of a break um, no, no, why, uh, why? You, you needed a break? <laughs> this is crypto, I, nobody sleeps. Oh, I sort of needed just a very, very brief break. Oh, how um, dare you? I know I've been very naughty, and I apologize to everyone here. I you should be ashamed. apologize to me, I missed you. <laughs> <laughs> but here I am, so that's what counts. Um, I'll be attending um, uh, various conferences in the next few months, uh, some of which include um, uh, the Coins Bank Cruise, the decentralized uh, summit in uh, um, in November. And speaking of November, there's going to be quite a huge conference here in Malta, uh, which is the Malta Blockchain Summit. And of course, I'll be attending that one. Cool. Well. I'll be there as well. All right. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, it's always a pleasure speaking to you. Likewise. Um, listeners, please remember, share our show, rate our show. Tell everybody about your about this show. It's uh, got to grow, got to grow. And I'll see you next week for more information from Blockchain Island. <laughs>